wondering what it takes to scale DevOps in a large public sector organization? Let's listen in with Eric Mosier from MPO DevX about scaling DevOps at the NSA. He'll talk to us about the DevOps journey and the technology they used along the way, including infrastructure as code. Hello, and welcome to Scaling DevOps at the NSA. I'm Eric Mosier, and I'm here from the National Security Agency. And this is the story of how we upgraded our GitLab instance, four major versions in one day. We upgraded from version seven to 11. I'm Eric Mosier, and I am part of a group called DevX at NSA, and that is improving the developer experience. I lead a team called the DevOps Pipeline, and that's the team that runs GitLab within NSA. I've been at NSA for eight years. I've had a variety of technical roles, and I started my career with front-end work doing data visualizations, um, and that sort of led me to being interested in the server side and issues of size and scale, and this ultimately led me to cloud technologies, CI, CD, DevOps, and things of that nature. Okay, so I'm here from NSA. Let's get it out of the way up front. Some things are classified, some things I can't talk about. In general, numbers are not something I can talk about. Um, but what I can say is, um, as far as number of users, I can't say the number of users we have in our GitLab instance, but I can say that issues of size, scale, and number of users are a concern for our architecture. I can't say specifically what our developers do at NSA. However, I can say that we have a lot of different flavors of developers and technologists. These range from system administrators, data scientists, front end, back end, database administrators, as well as others. I can't say how many GitLab licenses we have, but I can say that we use the enterprise edition. I can't say exactly when we upgraded from version seven to 11, but I can say that we did it in one day. It was a long day and we, did, um, and we learned a lot in that process. I can't say number of servers, instances, or compute that we use. However, I can say that we've, de we've deployed a highly available, elastically scalable architecture in AWS. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. As far as GitLab CI CD, I can't confirm numbers of things like uh, jobs, pipelines, or number of runners. Um, but I can say that we use a set of shared runners with Docker plus machine, and that allows uh, people to get started with CI CD. And we also allow folks to connect their own runners. It's a large number, and I think that's been one of the cool things to see. So, what is NSA? We have two main missions. The first is foreign signals intelligence, and that's all about providing that intelligence to policymakers in the military for decision making. The second is cybersecurity. That's all about protecting networks and sensitive information. And behind these two missions are many developers, system administrators, network administrators, and other technical folks that have to run the capabilities that power these two missions. We're part of the intelligence community and the Department of Defense, and we are the largest enterprise in the IC. And because we're such a highly technical agency, we do a lot with open source. We release open source, we contribute to open source, and you can find some of the stuff that we've released at code.nsa.gov. Before I talk about the actual upgrade and, and the things we learned there, um, I think it's helpful for, uh, I think it's helpful to uh, understand the constraints that we're under. The first is that we are in an air gap. That means that we, don't have internet, there's no internet access. So many capabilities um, might assume that it can reach out to an internet URL. That doesn't work for us. The second is our ATO process, authority to operate. This is our security process, and this leverages additional requirements that we have on us. Um, and you can think of this, this process as more rigorous than HIPAA compliance. So GitLab at NSA, how did it get started? It started with a source code install in about 2013, and it was a modified version of that source code. It was started by volunteers because there was no 
solution for Git version control at the time. And it came out of a team whose job was something else. Their job wasn't GitLab. And they, they simply did it for their needs as well as they allowed other folks to use it. And over time, this service gained momentum. And I think this is something you can see in, in government spaces as well as uh, many places in industry. The service grew, the number of users grew, but the team did not. The team didn't, was not able to scale fast enough to meet the demand. And so the instance, uh, the instance suffered as a result and the service suffered as a result. Fast forwarding a little bit to mid-2018, that this is what GitLab and NSA looked like when I first got involved with it. It was a single server with aging hard, on aging hardware. And it was, because it was that modified source code, it was a long process to update to the latest version. So this meant, um, because it was that modified source code, we had to kind of own the entire code base, even though we were only changing certain parts. It was version seven, and because it was version seven, there was no GitLab CI CD. And because there wasn't this support for the instance, there was a lack of trust in the instance and the service that it provided. Again, in mid 2018, something else started to change in NSA, and that was something called DevX which was improving the developer experience. And because of DevX, things started to change a little bit with our GitLab instance. The first part was that DevX took on support of the GitLab instance, along with some other developer tools that were out there. DevX began a lot of cultural shifts that continue today. Um, we do things like postmortems. We uh, read and talk to people about DevOps and the principles there. And we do a lot of coaching on CI CD practices as well. And these continue today. And I think the GitLab instance has enabled some of these to, to catch on, um, particularly in the CI CD realm. We took an inventory of the number of GitLab instances at NSA. And the reason we did this is we started to, because there wasn't that support in the GitLab instance, we started to see that other teams were running their own for their use. So a team might be developing something, something and then they will run a GitLab instance because they needed things like CI, CD and so forth. And some of the, the newer features uh, that weren't there in version seven. We compiled a list of changes that we made to the GitLab source code. And this was particularly helpful as we went into these discussions with the GitLab public sector team, because this enabled us to more smartly determine what was um, important and what was not important as far as those changes. And the last thing is we developed, we uh, assembled a passionate team um, to run this instance. This was a team of like-minded and driven individuals that their job was to run and update this GitLab instance and to keep it upgraded. And I think, I think the, the talent of this team is one of the things that really made us successful. And I think that that can't be understated. This kind of began our public private partnership. We approached um, the GitLab public sector folks with a few goals in mind. We had, these were kind of rough goals. We didn't know all of these things going in. Um, but over time in these discussions, this began to develop. We knew we wanted to upgrade. We were on version seven, version 11 was the latest at the time. So we knew we wanted to upgrade. We knew we wanted to get off of that single server architecture, but we weren't quite sure how. And over time we, we found that AWS was a possibility for us. And that was part of the reason we went with this high availability, elastic scaling architecture. We wanted to have a more sustainable upgrade path in the future. We know that GitLab commercially releases the 22nd of every month. So we wanted to be within a few weeks of that commercial release. And we knew we wanted to automate. The server as it stood was not version controlled. The configuration of the server was, was difficult to, to find and to reason about. So we, we knew we wanted to script and automate as much as we could uh, 
to make everything repeatable, reduce errors, and do this stuff faster. And I think another thing that helped a lot here was we involved an AWS solutions architect from the start. And so in many of these early conversations, we would have our team from NSA, GitLab public sector, and AWS in the room. And this enabled us to move very, very quickly and to leverage the expertise of everyone in the room to move us forward and make these architectural decisions. Through this partnership with GitLab, we, we needed to make some changes to the upstream source code. And what we did is we focused on the things that were core to our, core to our security posture. And because we had that list of changes, we were able to figure out, okay, what, what was really important here, what was not. Um, so for example, a, a help link might not be important. So we, we left that stuff out and we focused on the things that were really core to security. And these are, these are really those things is we have headers and footers in the ap application. We have a project classification, which is the ability to label a project based on the sensitivity of that code. And we have external authorization. We require both authentication and authorization. Um, and the authorization is done with a call to an external service. And this external authorization is, is done with that call to an external service and checks what the person has access to. The path toward version 11, because we had those upstream changes made to the source code, we were able to stop modifying it. And this has been one of our core things that we've, we've kept up with is not modifying the source code. We've moved fully to Omnibus and that's enabled us to keep up with these versions. Because this was also a cloud migration baked into the upgrade as well, we debated doing a lift and shift to the cloud. A lift and shift would be if we took what was on premises and moved it to the cloud without any real changes. And I think in some of these early conversations, we um, leveraged that AWS solutions architect knowledge to really ensure that we were taking advantage of, of the good things that are available in the cloud. And so we decided against that lift and shift. We decided it was risky enough to do this upgrade and we could only improve the service by, by doing this. We scripted the entire process of version seven to 11. This was version seven source code, moving to version seven omnibus, several versions in, in between, and then version 11 omnibus. We used rsync and pg dump to sync, our, sync the data to the cloud. So the git data and the database, we needed to get that stuff over to the cloud and that enabled us the day of the upgrade to only sync a couple hours of data rather than the entire data set. We went big on those cloud resources to start with because we didn't have a great idea of what our size and scale would be. And we knew, we, we suspected anyway, that things would catch on and, and more usage would happen. So we went big on those to start with and then we scaled them back later on once we had a better idea of what we really needed. We communicated with our customers through blog posts and other means to make sure that they knew what was going on, what was coming, what our dates were, and any blockers that we had run into. And because this was a new team, I think this did, did something to, uh, to build that trust in this team because we were communicating so much that we were able to answer many of the questions that our customers had. And all of this stuff enabled us to practice. And that was one of the things that enabled us to not roll back the day of. Um, we practiced everything from the infrastructure as code. We stood everything up and tore it all down. We practiced the process of version 7 to 11. We practiced that with data, without data, with practice data, um, with the real big data set, all, all of that stuff. We practiced that. And the day of the upgrade, we had a corrupted PG dump. And we knew we knew we had seen that. And that enabled us to go fix it and to move forward rather than having to roll back. For the upgrade itself, we started with known technologies. 
And what I mean by known technologies is that we had some level of expertise that we could uh, leverage there. The first of those technologies was cloud formation. We used that to create the AWS infrastructure. So this created things like RDS, uh, relational database service, EC2 instances, all of that sort of stuff. We did this partially because the AWS solutions architect had some of that cloud formation knowledge and that enabled us to get a lot of those best practices and move quickly with it. The second technology was salt stack. And going back to the idea of known technologies, we chose this technology because I personally had about two years of experience with it. And that enabled us to move very, very fast. I was able to answer questions. I was able to do a lot of it myself. And that, that helped us move quickly because moving quickly with this upgrade was one of our big uh, concerns. The last piece was we used GitLab CI CD to tie everything to get together and to automate that automation. And this mirrors how GitLab.com is run. Uh, GitLab uses GitLab to build GitLab. It's a chicken and egg problem. But um, this, uh, this enabled us to do things like use merge requests to uh, have a code review and then that would trigger a pipeline which would create infrastructure. Post upgrade, we continued with those frequent blog posts, particularly in that first one to two months where, um, where we had at least some stability issues. And those were, most of those were resolved really quickly, but this communication went a long way to answering the questions and saying, hey, we're on this, here's what's going on, here's what we're doing about it, and all of that. We learned a tremendous amount and we performed a post-mortem and shared that internally. And while I can't share a ton of details from that, what I can say is that it really came down to testing. We didn't know the right kind of testing to do. Um, and we needed some smarter automation. And so after the upgrade, we made sure to build in more of this automated testing um, because we had a better idea of what we needed. And then we also, added that smarter automation, which is instead of focusing just on the creation of the infrastructure, we then also focused on updating that infrastructure. And so this, this enabled us to move uh, to controlling things more with Git and less with the AWS um, console. We responded to user feedback. And after we upgraded, one of the first things we heard is when's pages coming. So we got on that pretty quickly and within a couple months we were able to deploy it. And the last thing here is that we moved from NFS to Giddily and this did a tremendous amount for error rates on pushes and pulls. Um, the original upgrade included NFS um, that was part of the recommendation from GitLab public sector. Um, and then moving to Giddily uh, enabled us to, to reduce those error rates and to kind of mirror what was going on with gitlab.com. So post upgrade, since we went in with these known technologies to start with, we knew we wanted to come back and revisit that after we were upgraded and stable. The first thing we did is we moved from CloudFormation to Terraform. And one of the big reasons we did this is because CloudFormation restricts you to AWS only. And we don't have any immediate need to move from AWS but moving to Terraform has already enabled us to talk to a, a couple other things that we, we might need that are on the side that are, uh, that are separate from that AWS infrastructure. And so this was, this was our reasoning for moving to Terraform. The second was we moved from SaltStack to Ansible. And the reason we did this is because SaltStack uses that server agent architecture and that sort of added some complexity. Um, yes, Salt can be run without a master, but we felt that Ansible kind of simplified that workflow for us. And so that, that was the, the next technology we changed. And GitLab CI CD, we kept that as tying everything together and using GitLab to build GitLab. Um, and that, uh, that leads in well to the next slide. So 
this is our architecture, what I, what I can show of our architecture. And starting at the bottom there, you'll see something called what we call GitLab Ops and our deploy runner, which is a shell runner. And that's the GitLab that we use to build and configure GitLab. And so the rest of the architecture is what, um, what actually runs the service that people use. Um, and all of that is driven through our Terraform and Ansible code along with the CI CD pipelines um, that talk to AWS. So the separation there is Terraform talks to AWS and then Ansible configures those machines after they're created. And the second thing that's important to point out here, if you look up in the middle or at our auto scaling layer and then in front of pages, there's two things in red there. You'll see gem, which is an OmniAuth gem that we, we pair along with GitLab Omnibus. And then Nginx and Node.js app in front of pages, that's proxying pages for us to do that authorization that I discussed earlier. And these two things in red are the only custom things we have. And that's why we're able to move quickly here is that we've cut down on any custom work that we're doing and those, those custom things are very, very stable and they integrate well with, with GitLab. So outcomes here. This was a great public-private partnership between NSA, GitLab, and AWS. And I can't stress enough that involving these um, other organizations was one of the key things to our success here. We learned a lot and we leveraged the expertise of GitLab and AWS to make this happen. And that was one of the, one of the cool things to see because I think it's, uh, that's fairly rare in government spaces that we move this quickly and, uh, and do things this well. We've seen a lot of CI CD adoption and that's simply by virtue of the tool being available for people to use and this has been one of the really cool things to see where we, we have folks coming to us asking questions, saying, here's what I'm doing with CI CD, here's what I want to do, how do I how do I do that stuff? And we've seen a lot of folks move from Jenkins to GitLab CI as well. And our goal of keeping up with the commercial versions, we have kept up and we're within a few weeks of the, the latest release, with the exception of major versions. So for example, version 12 to 13. That might take a little bit longer. That might take about a month, but we're still able to move pretty quickly with those versions. And lastly, one of the things that has been gr really great for me personally is seeing all of those folks come to us and say, hey, you, what you're doing is awesome. What you're doing is empowering our mission. And that is what, that's what really keeps me personally going with a lot of this. Thank you very much for listening, and I look forward to answering any questions you have about the talk in the chat room.